Although at times, uh, you're, you're pretty scared when you have to roll in on something up there, especially when you look down and you see nothing but a black cloud or a white cloud down below you. It's, uh, it's about as, as scary a mission as I've ever been on. I think it tries you to just about the maximum uh, uh, the missions. America's involvement in Vietnam saw the world's greatest military power thrown into a small war in Asia. Nowhere was that power more evident than in the air war against North Vietnam. The aim of the bombing campaigns against the North was initially to stop the flow of supplies heading to the insurgents in South Vietnam. Ultimately, however, it was to evolve into a campaign directed against the communist war potential. It smashed transport and industrial infrastructures, bridges, roads, railways, ports and airfields, as well as military targets, factories and supplies being shipped to the Viet Cong. The war in the north was fought mostly by fighter bombers like the F-105 Thunder Chief and the F-4 Phantom. Massive B-52 Stratofortress bombers unloaded thousands of tons of high explosive over North Vietnam. Operating from carriers in the South China Sea and from bases in South Vietnam, the US Navy and Marine Corps were also key players in the air campaign. They deployed F-4 Phantoms, F-8 Crusaders, A-4 Skyhawks, A-6 Intruders, and A-7 Corsairs in an intermittent eight-year campaign against some of the world's heaviest air defenses. It was the biggest, heaviest, toughest, and most powerful single-seat fighter bomber of its time. Designed as a tactical nuclear bomber, the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief bore the brunt of America's bombing campaign against North Vietnam. Known universally as Thud, the big fighter went into action in 1965. During the first three years of operations against the North, it was numerically the most important strike aircraft serving with the US Air Force in Southeast Asia. Operating from bases at Karat and Taklai in Thailand, Thunder Chiefs carried the war day in, day out up north. Although capable of firing bullpup air-to-surface missiles, the main task of the Thug was to deliver free-fall bombs against North Vietnam. Each carried a regular warload of six 350-kilogram bombs and two fuel tanks. Thugs were also the most important defense suppression aircraft in Vietnam. Flying some of the most dangerous missions of the war, 
Wild Weasel Thunder Chiefs played a deadly cat and mouse game against radar guided SAMs and artillery over North Vietnam. They would fly deliberately close to the missile sites, hoping to entice the Vietnamese into firing up their radars and missiles. They would try to evade any SAMs and flak fired at them and then attack with their own anti-radar missiles. Half of the 830 F-105s ever built were lost in combat in Vietnam, the majority to anti-aircraft fire, but their contribution to the war was immense. Known to its crews as the buff, or politely as the big, ugly, fat fella, the B-52 was used mainly as a tactical bomber in Southeast Asia. Since 1957, the B-52 had been the primary long-range nuclear bomber of Strategic Air Command, but in Vietnam, it was used as a conventional bomber. In saturation raids, codenamed Arc Light, the B-52 hammered suspect Viet Cong positions in the jungle and attacked communist supply routes in Cambodia and Laos. Later in the war, it flew strategic bombing missions against North Vietnam. The B-52 had been designed to deliver a limited number of nuclear weapons, but a special modification called Big Belly converted it into a bomber with an astonishing conventional payload. Special racks were clipped into the internal weapons bay, increasing capacity from 27 bombs to 84. Further racks fitted under each wing took the total capacity to an amazing 108 bombs. The total weapons load of a single aircraft was over 35 tons, which was the equivalent to that carried by an entire squadron of World War II flying fortress bombers. The B-52 attacked from so high that even such a big bomber couldn't be seen or heard from the ground. The first the enemy knew that the buff was about was when the earth trembled as the bombs exploded. Hugging the ground, the Viet Cong could only wait until the holocaust of steel and fire had passed until the next time. During the linebacker raids in late 1972, B-52s attacked North Vietnam over 11 days in the most concentrated bombing campaign ever seen. In 1964, North Vietnam allegedly attacked two U.S. Navy destroyers in the Tonkin Gulf. In retaliation, the U.S. Navy was authorized to attack port facilities at Hai Phong in North Vietnam. The chosen weapon was the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk. Dating back to the 1950s, this lightweight hot rod of an attack jet provided sterling service from the U.S. Navy's carriers and from marine land bases in South Vietnam all through the war. It performed the bulk of Navy bombing missions against the North until 1968. It also flew the specialist Iron Hand defense suppression missions against the formidable Vietnamese air defenses. Although tiny, with a wingspan of just over 8 meters, the A-4 had an amazing weapons carrying ability for its size, combined with high agility. It had a warload of nearly 4 tons. This ranged from free fall bombs up to 900 kilograms to unguided 70 millimeter rockets as well as bullpup air to surface guided missiles. The A-4 was eventually replaced on large deck carriers by the more capable A-7 Corsair. However, it continued to serve on the smaller decked carriers of the modified Essex class right up to the end of the war. As a result of their long and active combat career, more A-4s were lost than any other type of carrier-based aircraft. Skyhawks accounted for 37% of the U.S. Navy's combat losses in Vietnam. Unquestionably, the most important combat aircraft of the Vietnam War was the McDonnell F-4 Phantom, the big, powerful two-seater 
saw extensive combat service with all three services, Navy, Marines and Air Force, flying off carriers in the South China Sea and from land bases in South Vietnam and Thailand. Making its combat debut in 1965, the Phantom had superb performance, a top speed of over Mach 2, a powerful radar and potent, if occasionally unreliable, missile armament. It flew three key missions, fighter, bomber and reconnaissance. With nearly 150 air-to-air -air kills, the F-4 shot down more MiGs than any other US fighter. But its primary role was actually that of fighter-bomber. During the later stages of the war, it replaced the F-105 Thunder Chief as the US Air Force's most important bomb hauler up north. It also became an important aircraft for delivering laser-guided weapons. With the Marine Corps in South Vietnam, the Phantom was a key close air support aircraft, attacking with napalm, bombs and rockets. The keys to the Phantom's success were its versatility and its capacity for further development. As the war progressed, new F-4 variants entered service with even better fighting capabilities. The Navy's first version, the F-4B, gave way to the F-4J, which introduced, among many improvements, a much better radar and weapon system and more powerful engines. Air Force F-4Cs were similarly improved. Reconnaissance was a key mission, and McDonald developed the RF-4 fitted with panoramic cameras in an extended nose. This unarmed version flew its first combat missions in Vietnam in late 1967. Lack of a built-in gun for air combat was a major phantom shortcoming. Gun pods were effective, but the problem was only fully solved with the F-4E model, which had its own 20mm cannon. If the Phantom excelled in any one area, it was as a fighter. Other aircraft deployed against North Vietnam included the Grumman A-6 Intruder, the Navy's most advanced all-weather attack jet. It proved to be an outstanding aircraft when it began combat operations in July 1965 and quickly became the US Navy's standard medium attack aircraft. Able to drop seven tons of weapons, it was the Navy's Mini B-52. And sophisticated avionics meant it could find the target and deliver these weapons in all weathers, by day or night, with pinpoint accuracy. Other intruder versions were developed for key missions, including defense suppression, in-flight refueling, and electronic warfare. A-7 Corsairs were used by both the Air Force and the Navy in the light attack role. Replacing the A-4 Skyhawk from late 1967, the A-7 was faster and carried an even bigger weapon load, nearly seven tons. The Corsair was a key aircraft for flying Iron Hand defense suppression missions. Obtaining intelligence on the North Vietnamese military machine was a highly dangerous mission. The superfast McDonald RF-101 Voodoo gathered much of the tactical reconnaissance from the North during the first half of the war. In the words of one pilot, the single-seat machine flew alone, unarmed, and unafraid, taking pictures with its fan of panoramic and oblique cameras. The vital information obtained had a price. Many Voodoos were shot down. From 1970, the Voodoo gave way to the RF-4C Phantom, which provided the Air Force with virtually all its tactical reconnaissance during the later years. Strategic reconnaissance was provided by the Mach 3 capable Lockheed A-12 and SR-71 Blackbird and the high-flying Lockheed U-2 operating from bases in Japan and Thailand. Navy and Marine Corps pilots also flew RF-4 Phantoms as well as RF-8 reconnaissance versions of the much-loved Voigt Crusader fighter.
but the most important carrier-based reconnaissance aircraft was the elegant and effective North American RA-5 Vigilante. These were among the fastest and heaviest aircraft ever to serve on carriers. Support aircraft included Boeing KC-135 tankers and RC-135 intelligence gathering versions. The tankers provided refueling for bombers and strike aircraft heading north. The KC-135 also saved many aircraft and aircrew which were returning after combat with low fuel or battle damage. Lockheed EC-121 Constellation flying radar stations monitored the skies above the north, while Douglas EB-66 destroyers provided electronic countermeasure support by escorting Air Force strike packages. The B-66 was based on the Navy's A-3 Sky Warrior, which fulfilled a similar ECM role. The A-3 was also an important tanker and gatherer of electronic intelligence. Many aircraft were involved in combat rescues, but the most important were the vulnerable A-1 Sky Raider, nicknamed SPAD, which escorted the Sikorsky HH-3 Jolly Green and the HH-53 Super Jolly Green Giant rescue helicopters deep into hostile territory. U.S. pilots going into battle over North Vietnam were opposed by the most sophisticated and concentrated air defense network the world had ever seen. The Hanoi Haipong area was protected by the world's heaviest concentration of anti-aircraft artillery, well coordinated with MiG fighters and surface-to-air missiles. In 1964, the North Vietnamese had fewer than a thousand medium and heavy anti-aircraft guns to defend the entire country from air attack. Within 18 months, there were more than 7,000 guns in place, some of which were radar directed. These ranged in caliber from the very heaviest, over 100 millimeters, to North Vietnamese peasants taking pot shots at attacking aircraft with their rifles. Whatever the size of gun fired, the North Vietnamese met every U.S. air raid with a hailstorm of fire. Triple-A accounted for by far the majority of U.S. losses in Vietnam. Between 1962 and 1973, over 2,000 Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps aircraft were shot down by anti-aircraft guns in Vietnam. Alongside the guns, the surface-to-air missile posed a major threat. An American pilot describes his impressions of the North Vietnamese air defenses. Black was kind of a random thing. Uh, you never had the feeling that uh, a particular gun was shooting at you in particular. There was just a lot of it around, and sometimes you got hit, sometimes you didn't. Uh, the scariest thing was the surface-to-air missile, which you knew uh, once one was launched, you basically watched it, made a couple maneuvers with your airplane, and if it was following your airplane, it was real obvious. And then it was a ma matter between you personally and that missile. And that was much scarier, even though it was statistically much less dangerous than AAA. It was much scarier because it was a lot more personal. By 1972, North Vietnam had more than 300 operational SAM sites. Fighters were also an important part of the defensive mix with MiG-17s and MiG-21s being the main North Vietnamese defensive fighters. Both were formidable in air combat and were flown with skill and aggression by their pilots. MiGs and missiles accounted for some 276 American aircraft losses. Rolling Thunder was the name of the first stage of the bombing campaign against the North. It lasted from 1965 to 1968. Air Force planners had intended Rolling Thunder to be an all-out offensive against Hanoi's capability to wage war. However, 
President Johnson restricted the scope of operations and would only allow more limited operations and a strictly defined series of targets. Each of these had to be approved directly by the White House. Crews flew missions day in, day out. Lines of tension are evident as a mission is announced against a particularly well-defended target. The target itself is an unserviceable railroad bridge under construction. It is considered to be probably deck type with three spans, 280-foot single track. There are two concrete piers and two concrete abutments that have been complete. Across Air Force bases, fighter bombers, reconnaissance aircraft and fighters are prepared for their missions against the North. Aboard a U.S. Navy carrier steaming on Yankee Station in the Tonkin Gulf, similar preparations are made.
heavily laden combat fighter bombers like the F-4 and the F-105 burn fuel at a prodigious rate. To extend endurance, combat aircraft in Southeast Asia were supported by the KC-135 tankers of Strategic Air Command, which performed hundreds of thousands of refuelings during the war. Tankers provided them with fuel to burn on the way to the target and were there waiting when the combat jets came out with dry tanks after combat. Only five U.S. pilots and their backseaters gained ace status in Vietnam. The sole Navy aces were Randy Cunningham and his radar intercept officer, Willie Driscoll. Here, Cunningham describes his first MiG kill, which he scored while flying a Phantom in 1972. I just got through breaking from 36 SAMs that were fired at us over Quang Lang Airfield. And as I came out of a SAM break, just trying to get out of the area, I saw two MiG-21s at treetop level exiting the target. Uh, one was about 500 feet, the other one was about 800 feet stepped up like this. And I was doing about 650 knots at treetop level. And as I came up behind the, the one MiG-21, uh, Willie said he's locked. He had a little look up. And just as I fired the missile, and the missile came off the side, he went into about, looked like about an 8G turn. And you could just see the vapor trails turning off of his wings. I did an aileron roll and then brought my nose back to him. And just as he dropped his wing, I shot my second missile. No MiG had been shot down in almost two years. The realization was like a dream. Uh, the adrenaline was there, uh, just like when you win a gold medal in the Olympics. 
uh, the excitement was there. F-4s accounted for nearly 150 kills against North Vietnamese fighters. Air Force F-105 Thunder Chiefs and Navy F-8 Crusaders were the next top MiG scorers. But the Americans didn't have it all their own way. Vietnamese MiGs shot down 79 U.S. aircraft. In total, U.S. pilots shot down 250 North Vietnamese aircraft in air combat. Superior pilot training made the American fighters more than a match for the slower but more agile Soviet-built MiGs flown by their opponents. But the kill ratio, the ratio of victories to losses, was far less than that achieved during the Korean War and prompted a radical rethink into U.S. air combat training. The pace and scale of the U.S. air attacks against the North made combat losses inevitable. However, aircrew faced the intense barrage of flak, missiles and enemy aircraft in the knowledge that should they be shot down over North Vietnam, every effort would be made to rescue them. To this end, the U.S. Air Force set up special rescue squadrons in northern Thailand, equipped with long-range rescue helicopters and propeller-driven A-1 Sky Raiders. Nicknamed Sandy, these suppressed the Vietnamese forces in the area as well as coordinating the rescue effort. It was always a race against time to see who would reach the downed crew first. The Rolling Thunder bombing campaign, paid for with huge cost to both sides, never came close to forcing the North Vietnamese to give in. In spite of the US air attacks, troops and supplies still left the North, wading, swimming or by foot, to support the war effort in South Vietnam. A US bombing halt was imposed from November 1968 to May 1972. By this time, U.S. President Johnson had been succeeded by Richard Nixon, who unleashed the full might of American air power during the Linebacker II strategic bombing campaign in the last days of 1972. The chief instrument of American retribution was to be the B-52, which would be let loose without restriction against the North's war-making capability. At the height of the campaign, air bases on Guam in the Pacific and in Thailand hosted more than 200 B-52s. The B-52s were supported by other Air Force and Navy jets flying defense suppression missions and diversionary raids.
In an 11-day campaign over Christmas, the B-52s bombed Hanoi and Haiphong, striking at strategic military targets in the middle of heavily populated areas. B-52's main defensive tactic against SAMs was to fly in cells of three to maximize their mutual electronic countermeasures protection. In spite of this, the North Vietnamese fired their SAMs in barrages and managed to shoot down 15 B-52s as well as hitting and damaging many more. However, the B-52 raids virtually brought North Vietnam to its knees. They had destroyed much of its petroleum reserves and electrical generating capacity. The B-52 missions were decisive in forcing Hanoi to the peace table and ending America's long presence in the war. In the war against North Vietnam, American pilots encountered the heaviest air defenses ever fielded in modern warfare. Hampered for much of the war by restrictive rules of engagement, a political decision that was to cost many American lives, they ultimately brought North Vietnam to the brink of ruin in the final massive campaign. February of 1965, President Johnson ordered continuous bombing of North Vietnam in retaliation for the numerous North Vietnamese attacks on U.S. installations.
landing in groups of threes, they would depart from a U.S. Air Force base in Bangkok, Thailand to drop 90 tons of explosives on North Vietnam. October of 1965, there were over 100,000 U.S. American troops in Vietnam, with U.S. Marines doing most of the fighting. The U.S. Navy was responsible for providing tactical air support for the South Vietnamese Army. States Marines were among the first U.S. troops to land on Cam Ray Bay in South Vietnam.
1966, over 200,000 American soldiers were in Vietnam. In the South, the military strategy has shifted from that of pacification to that of search and destroy. consisted of 38 South Vietnamese soldiers combined with a U.S. Marine Rifle Squad. As the confidence of the North Vietnamese Army grew, guerrilla tactics gave way to major offensives.
have now become a daily reality for the South Vietnamese. The number of displaced and homeless had become staggering. For many of the children, war became their only teacher. U.S. firepower continued to exact its toll on the North Vietnamese.
February 1968, the Communists launched the Tet Offensive, attacking almost every major capital city in South Vietnam. Once again, the people of South Vietnam were the real losers.
troops at the Marine Air Base at Quezon began preparing for an attack they knew would come. Meanwhile, further south in Saigon, not only the city but the U.S. Embassy was under siege by the North Vietnamese. Although the attack on Saigon was unsuccessful, the toll on the civilian population was immense. Quê, one of the oldest cities in South Vietnam, was not spared and fell victim to the North Vietnamese. U.S. Marines were called upon to retake the city. Although suffering heavy casualties, they decisively defeated the North Vietnamese Army. <laughs> 